Hello, um, my name is Shami Mirza and I am the cashierless lead at 7-Eleven. A little bit about myself, um, I spent the last several years in applied AI ML, actually going through figuring out how to scale and develop technologies using AI in different domains and it's typically seen outside of software. So in the real world, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of um, developing things for retail and other situations where you may not typically see AI being directly applied. Um, and so what I really specialize in, what the team really specializes in is how do we build those technologies and then actually grow them and optimize them in a way to make them ready for market. Um, and today what I'll be presenting on briefly is the cashierless store that we developed over the course of a year and maybe a case study, a brief case study on how that cashierless store um, actually works. So with that, let's begin the talk. So the title of the talk is how 7-Eleven built a cashierless store in less than a year using applied AI to disrupt convenience. So during this talk, we're gonna go through three things, 7-Eleven's past, its present, and the future. So let's start with the past. 7-Eleven is a convenience innovator. So you're probably agreed with that statement, agreeable with that statement. So Southland Ice Company was the first version of 7-Eleven and it was opened in 1927 as just that, an ice company. The founder realized that folks wanted some items every once in a while, like bread and milk, um, that were just simply easier to grab in late hours. And so he started offering them. With time, that became the core business and quickly evolved into a very popular service. Um, from there, several of those locations were uh, opened. They were originally called the totem stores because they were the giant totem in front of the store and people would tote away their goods. Um, so in 1946, the name was changed to 7-Eleven to reflect the extended hours that 7-Eleven had for convenience, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., the first store to ever really offer um, hours that long. In 1963, um, we actually opened our first 24-7 store right outside of the University of Texas, Austin, really to offer convenience at late hours to those young college students. Between 1963 and 1946, that period, there was a lot of innovation as well. Um, we did some of the first curbside delivery ever, uh, which as you can imagine is very popular right now, but actually was innovated way back in the 1950s by 7-Eleven even. In 1965, we started offering to-go coffee and Slurpees. Now, if you're familiar with the Slurpee brand, um, to-go coffee though was really the innovation that was never heard of before. People hadn't really done coffee on the go. It was always a sit down um, occasion. And so that is actually the innovation that quickly spread to a number of other vendors that you might be familiar with today, but it originated with 7-Eleven. In the 1970s, we did the first self-serve soda fountains. So if you've ever been to a store, um, a restaurant of any sort and served yourself soda, well, the first place to ever do it was 7-Eleven. And we're still the only company to offer both Pepsi and Coke side by side for that reason. No one else had done it before. And so the terms were set differently. The next statement might be a little bit newer to you, but 7-Eleven is digital. So over the last several years, we've focused heavily on digitally enabling the organization. We have a loyalty program with millions of users and millions of transactions that have gone through it. We have a delivery service, 7Now, and that really enables us to actually do delivery direct to our consumers, um, where we can deliver those goods that they need, the products, even hot foods. Um, we have mobile scan and pay. So customers are able to use their mobile phone to scan out and avoid lines or contact with cashiers of any sort. And finally, last year in 2019, we opened our research and development facility. And that's right about when we started work on all this cashierless stuff. And that brings me to the most controversial statement, most likely for you guys, which is 7-Eleven is a digital innovator. And how do we back that statement up? Well, cashierless. Um, you might have seen a large number of articles at some point talking about all of this um, unveiling of cashierless. And really, it is an enormous accomplishment for a company that has come from a history of being a traditional retailer and not a software company. But over the last year, we've really focused on developing that key machine learning and computer vision talent, as well as hardware engineers, systems engineers, people just focused on creating incredible technologies ready to scale. And so... We went from this, which is, uh, you'll see one of my peers here, Silas, he actually was one of the original people on the team, holding up a camera over a shelf to actually within literally less than a year, a fully open store, completely autonomous. And you can kind of get an idea of how the scale really works, but we've done a very good job of hiding the technology. So you can see up here, there are a large number of cameras um, and 
cameras all throughout the store and sensors throughout the store enabling this technology. Um, so how did we do that? How did we go from this to that in less than a year? Well, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? So this work is a culmination of a number of key um, disciplines. First and foremost, you have to think in terms of sensor fusion. One of the key problems in this space is understanding that one sensor can't give you a view of the entire store. So how do you combine information from multiple sensors in a way that allows you to actually process information simultaneously or near simultaneously, understand what each sensor is saying, extract the meaningful signal from it, and then combine it with multiple other sensors to be able to reflect the key capability or key information you need from it. The next part of that is distributed computing. No single computer is able to process all of the information simultaneously. So then how do you take information that's aggregated from multiple sensors, then aggregate it again at multiple different computers and combine that in a way to be able to understand fundamentally what's going on at each different sensor level as well as each different system level, and then combine that information to make decisions about the entire transaction. We have key advancements in computer vision where we came up with custom algorithms and solutions for us to actually observe, understand, train models, and create systems that are able to use computer vision to make key decisions and understand contextually exactly what's going on. So you may imagine situations where you have to do object detection. Well, imagine the scale when you have thousands and thousands of SKUs and 40 new SKUs every week almost. So how do you handle that complexity? How do you scale a system that's able to do that consistently, efficiently, and scalably. And um, the next part of that is hardware. We had to design custom hardware to be able to really understand exactly how that system has aggregated information to the circuit board, and that circuit board processes that hardware to be able to handle what's going on um, in terms of interactions with a shelf, for example. Um, that hardware itself was custom designed to be able to fit in certain form factors, as well as hardware that we've used to actually advance our edge compute. So how can we limit the total amount of computation done by the servers by making it more efficient at the edge? And finally, of course, all of this comes together with that popular word right now, machine learning. Um, all of these algorithms have to be understood and processed. So there's a lot of information, a high number of features. How do we combine information across a large number of features in a way that can help us understand exactly what's going on with any given transaction? But to do all of that, combine all those systems, build all those, I wanna pause for a moment and make sure everyone understands the thing that was most important in enabling the speed to market, right? How do we go from April having folks above a shelf holding a camera to November of 2019 having that store open? Um, and at the end of the day, culture is king. Uh, the team itself was exceptionally driven. We have incredibly passionate folks who really care about solving difficult problems. And we were really unleashed to go focus on this problem. Um, kudos to the leadership at 7-Eleven for allowing us to operate so independently and without bureaucracy, but they really let us focus on building the best possible technology as quick as possible. So I just wanna make sure that any leaders who are here understand that first and foremost, it starts with enabling your people and giving them the space to operate and trusting that they'll deliver. Um, so with that, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems that one faces in cashierless and kind of go into a brief case study because we have very limited time today. Um, speaking about one of the problems that we encountered early on and how we solved it. So there's three primary problems in any cashierless store and that is, where is everyone? So how are you tracking them? What did they interact with? So can you detect what they picked up? And if you detect it, um, can you assign it correctly? So what did they leave with? So once you have tracked them, you have to make sure you know what they did. So who is there, what did they do, and what did they leave with? Um, so really, once you understand those three questions, you have a fundamental baseline to be able to build a system that can handle this. So we're gonna focus on one um, specific thing here, which is combination of tracking and uh, the assignment problem, which is relatively complex depending on the density of folks, like how many people are in your store at any given moment. So let's jump into briefly a little bit of background on pose estimation. So um, for those who are unfamiliar, pose estimation is a way of using computer vision to estimate the position of skeletal key points on a given person. On the left, uh, you see a very famous image from one of the most popular papers discussing how key points, so the person's eyes, ears, nose, 
chest, center point, shoulders, hips are positioned based on a computer vision inference on that image um, of those key points. On the right, you see that si a similar situation where those key points are superimposed onto a particular person's body. And what that really allows you to see is what are people really doing when they're in the store? What are they reaching for? Um, where are they moving? What are they looking for? Um, and that really is fundamental to understanding some of the more common cases when multiple people are shopping at your store. So as you can imagine, a frequent occurrence may be that someone comes up to a shelf and they're standing near someone else. And you need to be able to understand exactly who is the person picking that item up. On the most basic level, um, for a number of approaches to this problem, some folks are trying to do pure computer vision um, and other folks use a combination of weight sensors and computer vision. We have gone with a weight sensor um, as well as a computer vision approach. And on the most fundamental level, if someone has activated weight sensor and there are multiple people around, how do we understand which of those people were most likely to have done that specific action? And that brings us to the second part of this, which is Post estimation is great when you have rich features and rich information from a side view. But when you're looking from the top view, often that same information is sparse. And in fact, labeling that information can be quite difficult, even for human labelers. As you can imagine, let's think about this person shown right at the center of the screen. Seeing exactly or estimating exactly where his knees are may be easy for some people, but far more difficult for others. And more importantly, figuring out where his feet or hips are is even more complex. So, just because we can estimate the upper half of the body or even a portion of the upper half, the entire network may not be able to give a solid answer across all of the key points and may not converge to a optimal solution. And so we needed to go through and train our networks to be able to not just handle angled view, but really true top view and slightly angled views as well. But how do we do that before collecting a ton of human data? I mean, you can imagine most of these data sets are trained with an enormous amount of data when it comes to um, things like the COCO data set, right? There's a lot of people side view and a lot of rich annotations. How do we get rich annotations in this sense? Well, first off, we did use data labeling. So there is some level of human labeling where we go through and we do our best to estimate where these key points are. But in addition to that, you need some level of precision, right, to be able to understand um, exactly what the key points might be for a given person that you may not be able to achieve with real data. Then what do you think happens? Well, uh, given that we have zero human data that's super precise, how do we address that? We use synthetic data. So synthetic data allows us to get exact, precise information about where each skeletal key point is for any given computer vision scene. Even though it may be exceptionally complex, the beauty of synthetic data is that it gave us the exact information we needed for every key point, no matter what. Whereas the image on the left may have had some disagreement across multiple annotators, there's never any disagreement on the image on the right because it's computer generated. Furthermore, it allowed us to actually handle something that's fundamentally important to any computer vision problem. And that is understanding how to model data that may be outside of your real human resources. So what do I mean? There may not be sufficient diversity in the folks in your lab that you may need to handle in the real world. And there's several ways to approach that. Perhaps you can get volunteers, et cetera. But at some point, the throughput of people won't be able to fully model the complexity of the population you may be needing to run inference against. Synthetic data enables us to actually do that. So we trained our models using synthetic data, not just to get more precise measurements, but also to get more precise understanding across multiple genders, multiple heights, multiple ethnicities, everything that we couldn't get with real data in the real world. And what you see here now is actually that same pose estimation task now working with real customers in our store. So this is just a quick GIF we threw together. And there's some debug images here to really understand, hey, who is reaching for that product? What's going on? What are the people doing as they're walking away? And what product was actually picked up? Um, we use these images to really understand how interactions occur throughout our store and really understand where and when our algorithms perform best and when they tend to reach edge cases where they aren't performant. This level of information allows us to then mine our data to continuously improve how we approach this problem. Now, I'm short on time, um, but that really is the key case study that we wanted to go over. And 
there's a ton of stuff that goes into a system like this. Um, I'll be here to answer questions, um, but that's just kind of a surface level initial introduction to one of the main problems we solved in our um, journey in building this cashierless door. We've made enormous advancements and improvements in the system since then. Um, I'm not obviously gonna have enough time to share any of those today, but I'm happy to talk a little bit more and answer any questions folks may have. Thank you.